Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, welcome um, to the den. Alhamdulillah, Brother Muhammad Ijab has found some time from his busy schedule to join us, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Doctors here as well, mashallah, with his uh, moments of clarity. Um, so I've titled the, um, the, this particular stream um, Evidence for God because I'm constantly having um, atheists um, asking me to prove God, what's your evidence? I, I'm, I'm an atheist because there's a lack of belief in God because there's not enough evidence and all of this kind of thing. So um, I personally believe it's a smoke screen they're hiding behind. I don't think they really understand what they mean when they ask for evidence. So um, I think one thing we're really interested in to understand, what do we mean when we say evidence? Or what do they think they mean when they say evidence? And then obviously when it comes to God, um, I use the word God, but usually I've used the word creator, as in the cause of everything. Um, because a lot of the questions they ask kind of misrepresent what we believe. So I think two things that re really need to be established is what do we mean when we um, say evidence and what do we mean when we say God? And then after that, we can move into the ideas of why we believe in a creator um, logically. Well, before before I do that, I want to say how much of a pleasure it is for me to be with the with the doctor, of course, but the Stone Cold Steve Austin of the Dow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I yes. I mean, this is when he comes to speak to his corner with his cap. I feel like there should be like you know that old school entrance music stuff for the lie, you know the the smashing <laughs> glass. <laughs> you know, and and it's been it's, it's a, I, I can't believe it's been this long since we've actually had a collaboration together. Uh, it's been a long time actually. It has yeah, been a long time. The EF Dow. I just want to say, yeah, I just want to say first and foremost, uh, we'll talk about some called There's two police officers walking right here. Hopefully, I'm not <laughs> going to stop you. I'm not driving the car anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to say, like, you know, the work that you guys are doing collectively as EF Dawa is really phenomenal, fantastic work. And for those mm -hmm. who don't know, EF Dawa is a group, and this is why it's important to have a group behind you. It's, it's a group of brothers, you know, including Dr. Uh, Amran, who uh, mm -hmm. obviously we've, we've done something together as well and, um, on the corona stuff. And Hamza, the Stone Cold Hamza, uh, and, 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 and Co, and Co, man. You know, they work together fantastically as a team. They've been translating stuff into different languages. You know, people, whenever I go to the Arab world, I've been to Saudi Arabia recently, they always ask me about Hamza. So, you know, everyone knows Hamza. If you go to, if you go to, if you go to Egypt or Saudi Arabia, it's going to be taking selfies, this man, because <laughs> people don't realize how, like the Dawa in Speaker's Corner has been a hub, but it's actually proliferated to the Arab world. And I, f I think like the number two or three demographic is the Arab world. I'm not sure about that, yeah. but it seems like it's the case. And also the like in Malaysia and stuff like that, you know, in Indonesia the work that's been done by EF Dawa is fantastic so I don't know if you guys have got a Patreon or if you guys have got a GoFundMe or whatever you guys have got but I you know encourage everybody to to fund this Dawa because the style that you guys have working together as a team and the, the proficiency and the efficiency um, and you know it's, it's about it's about character at the end of the day there's not many people that can represent Islam firmly you know and do so convincingly and instill confidence into the hearts of the people and Hamza's done that, and uh, you know, I feel like uh, I think we need to see more of you in the park that will that will calm people down a little bit now. Because when 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 big figures like Stone Cold are not there, then 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 you know, <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then the rest of them, then the rest uh, of these these clowns can come and play around. But, but yeah, no, it's, it's really it's, though. I, I was, I'm actually always like whenever I see Hamza, I feel yes, we've got the cavalry there, we've got we've got the people there, you know. And I always yeah, feel like, yes, we're, we're, we're the backup is, especially not just Hamza, but the entire team, that when they go together. And people, yeah, when they see Dr. Amran, they don't realize he's a, he's a professional doctor. He's a, he's a, he's a medic. He's a, he, he's a very intelligent medic who's he's now, you know, uh, into the Dawah as well. So, and, and helping and servicing the community. So all of you, mashallah, I just want to start this. It wouldn't be right for me to come on uh, Hamza's den and, 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 not, and not start with this. Oh, Jazakallah khair, bro. Yeah, no, it's amazing. It is amazing how the Dawah has spread internationally. You know, like um, we went on Umrah um, last January 
And subhanAllah, yes. Quran Masjid Nabawi, and we've got the students from Medina University come, oh, brother Hamza, oh, you have to have yeah. taking photos, taking photos. I told stuff. you, I told you. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Like you, 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 you're the scholars of tomorrow, man. And they're like, oh, we, we love your stuff. So, yeah, no. And then we've heard <laughs> in Indonesia that in some villages they have kind of screens watching um, watching the video. Allah, 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 Allah. It's amazing. That's beautiful. That's, subhanallah. It's absolutely amazing. It's, and it's an opportunity like that not many people have, Speaker's Corner. And and I reckon that when people talk about Speaker's Corner in a negative sense, I always like to bring EF Dawa and, and your efforts and also the SC Dawa as well and, and their efforts and, and the brothers as an example of actually where it's going really well. Where it's yeah. going really, really well. And yeah. no one can no one can say that with the tens of not even tens, probably hundreds of millions now, I don't know, of views of people across the world that have been now exposed to the message of Islam uh, through your videos that that is not good for Muslims and for Islam and for spreading Islam, for keeping people on Islam and all of all of the rest of it. There's there's very a weak argument to be made if we're gonna use that example. And that's why uh, it's always good to have like it's a professional setup, man. It really is. Yeah, and we're, we're missing the park, to be honest with you. We are yeah, missing that park because um, what, what's happening with that anyways? Why are you not coming to the park? What's going on? For me, for me, and, and I'm sure for the doctor and for Brother Abbas, it's all about the COVID. Because yeah. um, okay. if you see the events of the park what's going on there, I'm pretty mm -hmm. ha I'm happy I'm not there. <laughs> yeah. I thought that this week as well. I oh, don't know honestly. when I saw what happened. Yeah, there's no there's no social distancing. There's no you know people mask mask down around their faces and they're shouting at each other. And I'm thinking, mm. do you guys not think this COVID exists or something? Mm. So right now, the Boston came down on the tower. They're all spreading. No, but I do miss it. I I do I do miss yes. that rough and tumble. You know, we tried to bring it a little bit to these streams, but it's it's not the same thing. Because it, it, when you're in the park. Yeah. It's just roll yeah. the sleeves up. What what's coming? You don't know if it's an Islamophobe, is it a Christian, is it an atheist? You don't know what you know what I mean. And it's quite exhilarating. Yeah. The adrenaline's going, you know. Alhamdulillah. Hundred percent. And uh, you know, if the adrenaline is going for you, it's likely to be going for the people that are watching it as well. And this is what I think is real. It's, it's, the, it's the cutting edge, really, because when you're in front of a board, yeah, this is, this is a place for that white board, a chalkboard, whatever you want, um, PowerPoint screen. That there is a place for that. But when you're doing that. The average 15, 16, 17-year-old, the average man, woman, you know, teenager watching YouTube is not going to be tuning in for a long time. And they're not going to be they're not going to be interested. Yeah, they, they want to see the rough and tumble. I know. So it's amazing. SubhanAllah. But yeah, going going back to the, the questions that you asked, I think it's um, really important um, to these are two good starting points with an atheist or an agnostic or an ir irreligious person. Because I think the standard of truth is where we all, I always start in terms of personally when I speak to atheists, is all about the standard of truth. Because, and this, this is a branch of philosophy called epistemology. So how do you know things? How do you, how do you know, the, like how do you make sense of the world, basically? This is making sense or making sense of the world is epistemology. Like how do you get to know the, the study of knowledge? Um, how do you get to know things? Or the science of knowledge? And so what, um, ways can we can we come to a conclusion about something? And the first thing is we got to determine what the the atheist uh, standards are. If they're an empiricist, or if they just believe that, well, I won't believe in anything except if I see it or hear it or, or smell it or something to do with the five senses, which is basically the Quranic uh, in the Quran. He says, uh, "Len laka hatta nara Allah jahra." You know, we're not going. They said to Moses, "We're not going to believe." In you, ex except if we see Allah clearly, like so. This is actually an ancient empiricism, uh, and it continues to this day. Like the idea of we won't believe it until we see it. It's very easy to to show the weakness uh, of that uh, argument because there's many things that we know which we don't see. Either we know it through testimony, or we know it through um, rational argumentation, logical rules, mathematical rules. Or something which doesn't strictly or even at all um, come under the purview um, of empiricism. And in fact, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s and 50s, there was a school of thought in philosophy called uh, verificationism. And it was spearheaded by this guy called A.J. Ayer um, and, uh, and others, you know, uh, in Europe. And, the, and those guys were basically saying that uh, if something 
they were empiricists, so they believed in that it had to go through the five senses. Anything outside of the five senses was basically a meaningless statement. Um, okay. And so the problem, the problem with this is that even this idea of there, if something that is outside of the five senses is a meaningless statement, that idea in and of itself is not empirically justifiable, right? So people, like, you can even check it out online. Go on YouTube and say, AJ Air, probably one of the, if not the foremost uh, philosopher that was um, uh, pro-positivist and pro-verificationist, he wrote a very famous book that almost every philosophy student uh, must have heard of. Um, and he says, like, you know, this this whole school, he's smoking a pipe, he's speaking to someone, I can't remember, Brian Mabby, it's online, you can you can see, it. it's in the 50s, I think it was, it must have been filmed in the 70s or something like that, and he says that, you know, our theory of positivism or, or this verificationist principle, it fell apart because there were so many things that we couldn't prove using the empirical method. And so positivism and verificationism that was very popular in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and so on, it practic practically collapsed upon itself in the, um, uh, in the philosophical world or in the world, uh, in the academic world in the West. And what took its place uh, in the early, let's say, 80s, 90s, is falsificationism. Uh, and actually, this has implications with the philosophy of science. Because Karl Popper, who died, I believe, in 1997, I, I think it was 97, and he was, he was actually in the, um, he was a professor in the London School of Economics. He had a transformative effect on the philosophy of science. And most particularly, he kind of revised, if you like, the, the principle of verificationism which was predicated on a, on a hard empiricism on fal uh, to falsificationism. So this idea that uh, in order, so science is not premised on verificationism anymore. It's premised on fal this idea that Popper put forward, which is uh, falsification, which is why when a, when a scientist puts something out there uh, and they go to the laboratory or whatever, uh, and they say, this is, this, these are my findings. They can, it can be a scientific fact, but that's a scientific fact waiting to be disproved. No one can be really dogmatic enough with their um, studies to say, well, this will never be disproved, unless they're talking about something which is uh, observable. But un otherwise, if we're talking about something which has inductive um, implications, it's, imp it's almost impossible for, the for them to say, well, this will never change. Uh, so falsification kind of took hold. But So the, the point is empiricism, the idea that five senses, the five senses are the only things which uh, govern true knowledge is something that even within the academy and you know has been has been thrown away into the dustbins of history and even those foremost proponents of it um kind of threw it away as well so if if we hear that from atheists i think they should just kind of see the last century how it's gone uh, and how the discussion has kind of shifted from this uh from this in the academy and they'll realize that actually this this is a very weak position, extremely weak position, the hard empirical position that the, the only true knowledge uh, is that knowledge which is, um, which is of, of, you know verified through the five senses. Because how would you then make sense of that? How 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 could you even prove that on uh, empirically? So uh, I think that so th really there are many roots to truth. There's mathematical roots, there's logical roots, there's intuitive roots. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. And I feel, I feel like the first thing to do with an atheist is to get them to admit to that point. Because then we can start presenting arguments to them. Then we can start talking to them about, okay, well, do you accept A, B, and C? And then it can start becoming fruitful. But if they want to become ultra-skeptical when it comes to their standards of truth, because they know that discussion is going to be about um, theology, maybe, or, or the purpose of life, and really they want to move away from they want so I can navigate away from those discourses, then you're going to have a hard time, I think, from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think uh, understanding what their standards of evidence is, because, I mean, I was reading the day that a, a strong argumentation can be presented as evidence if it can't be mm. uh, refuted. Is that, is that true? Is that something that could be used, a um, strong argument? Yeah, I, I, the thing is about arguments is that really they there's different ways of presenting an argument, right? So in philosophy, there's inductive methods, deductive methods, abductive methods. These are the kind of three main methods uh, that philosophers use. 
But let's say we use deduction. So I'll give you an easy deduction, uh, every, you know, the, which is used in, in, in the books of logic. Like if you say uh, every, um, every man is mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, right? Right. So this is an easy... But then anyone can say, well, Socrates is not a man, for example. They can question one of the premises. It's a, that's a, so there's a difference now between valid argumentation and sound argumentation. So, so within the deduction, you have, or you can easily make a valid argument, but the question will always be, is it sound? And for it to be sound, it has to kind of meet the criteria of um, every premise being true. And by any point, someone can say, well, the premise is not true. Therefore, the argument is unsound. It could be valid, but it's unsound. For example, an example of a valid argument, but it's not sound, is if I say every uni if I just say every unicorn is uh, every um, unicorn is white, um, Polly is a unicorn, therefore Polly is white. This is a valid argumentation. It's consistent, but it's it's not sound in the sense that we can't prove that Polly exists in the real world. So now the question is, when we're making the argument, and this is where the atheist will always kind of try and hedge his bets. Say okay, you make a you make a you make a valid argument, but you don't make a sound argument. It's important when you're making those arguments to get the atheists to agree at each stage. And so, for example, I'm not going to present this because it's been done so many times, especially by like people like William Lane Craig. If you say everything that begins to exist has a cause, for example, and the atheist says, "I do you agree that everything that uh, begins to exist has a cause?" and the person says, "Yes." And do you agree that the universe began to exist? And the person says yes. Then, actually, if you agree to A and B, you have to agree to C. Now, the universe has a cause, right? Now, what the atheists will sometimes do is they'll question premise A and question premise B. So they'll say, well, I don't, I don't believe that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Or, more likely, they'll say the, the universe does not ex uh, begin to exist. So they'll believe in the eternal universe or something like, like it. Or they'll say that... Um, you're begging the question. Oh, they'll make any anything up, right? Or that um, you know, the, the, there's this fallacy here or that fallacy here, or that the universe, uh, you know, the the, the, the composition fallacy. They'll try and wedge in a fallacy somewhere. But the point is, if you agree with A and B, you have to agree with C. So if we can, if if the, if the atheist decides, okay, I want to use deduction, and you say, okay, I want to use, okay, you're going to use deduction. Then what you have to do when you're discussing with them is you're going to have to use deduction step by step and get them to agree to each premise, because you don't want them at the end of it to say, "Well, I agree with the validity of your uh, syllogism, but I don't agree with the soundness of it," because it's kind of like wasting your time. So if you if you get them to agree with premise one and premise two, then premise three is natural. It has to, it's it has to be the case. If A and B are true, then C has to be true. So th that's that's an example of a deductive type of argument. An example of a um, of an inductive argument is if we say, well, uh, there's a hundred swans, they're all white, therefore all swans are white. So that's a full-on, fully-fledged generalization. Problem with induction is that you, can you say that all swans are white because a hundred of them are white? There could be a black swan. And this is the problem that science suffers from because when when people make studies now, scientific studies, they they, they are confined to the, 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 the number of participants in that study group so if they have a hundred participants a thousand and obviously the bigger the better for the most part the bigger the better but you can't say it's completely generalizable because there's this chance that someone's going to make a bigger study and falsify going back to falsification your theory so there's always going to be limits to to how you use arguments whether it's uh, abductive and abductive is the, really the inference to the best explanation so we, we see uh, phenomena in a certain way and we say okay well what what explains this you have theory one two and three theory one explains it best for example i left dog food for my dog at home and i left i don't have a dog i'm just making this as an example <laughs> and then when i came back the the, the, the you know the, the bowl was empty so my inference to the best explanation that the dog ate the dog food yeah um i don't have anyone else at home that would eat it i don't have any other dogs that's my inference and i'd be happy living my life Knowing that the dog ate that food, or my cat, or the goldfish, or whatever I mean, animal you want to put in this equation. Uh, but so, once again, for me, it satisfies my uh, kind of uh, need, uh, skeptical need. 
But for other people, they say, well, actually, it could be the grandmother. She not opened the door. She has a key, and she ate the dog food from the box. And 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 the level of skepticism will start to rise when the when the stakes start to become higher for the atheist. Mm. So although you have three, uh, you have you know abduction, you have deduction, you have induction. All of them suffer from limitations. And if we're being honest, every single one of them, everything suffers. I mean, you can doubt almost anything. I mean, the most um, fundamental. Uh, phrase that was almost uttered in all of philosophy, which is cogito ego sum, uh, uttered by Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. He went through a whole skeptical, he has a book called The Meditations, and he went through a whole skeptical episode, and I think it's six chapters, and he says, I doubt my senses, I doubt this, and I doubt that. And then at the end, he says, there's one thing I don't doubt. I think, therefore, I am. And then this kind of laid the foundation for everything else. And so if this lays the foundation for everything else, I think, therefore, I am. Then you think, okay, no one's going to come after and be able to poke holes at this. But actually, Nietzsche comes out, I, when you say I, you're presupposing, you know, that you exist when you say I think. And others said, well, actually, you're presupposing language as well. When you say I think, therefore, I am, because you're using language in order to communicate that the, syntactically, you're using, you're using language. So even the most, like, and this is a branch of logical um, or philosophical foundationism uh, or, or, or rational, uh, you know, um, uh, foundationalism, where, where, where really you think uh, there's nothing, that is, is you've hit rock bottom, but actually even then you can start poking holes. But the truth is no one lives like that. We, we live mm -hmm. probabilistically. We, we live on basis of, okay, I'm here now. Um, I'm in a car right now. Could I be in a spaceship? I mean, if we wanted to exhaust all possibilities, it's possible that I'm asleep now and I'm on a spaceship in my dream. That's possible. But I'm willing to, to, to bet that I'm not like that. that. That's not the case. Why? Because I've experienced this before because of a range of pro, um, probabilistic factors that I uh, experience. And I'm willing to, 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 to risk whatever it is I'm going to risk uh, to believe that I'm actually in my car, not sleep, and so on and so forth. So um, these are the, these are the matters. I mean, if you want to be skeptical, we can always be very skeptical, right? Um, you can even be skeptical with your skepticism, and it becomes infinitely regressive. But if you'll see the sincerity of an atheist or an agnostic or whatever it is, if they are um, if they are willing to employ the same level of skepticism they do on a day to day life with the conversation about mm. the purpose of life and the ultimate origins and, and so on and so on. If, if they don't do that, then really I would say, if unless you're doing it for video purposes, like if you're making a video and showing the absurdity of this person's argument, I would say this person's actually a waste of time. I'd still present yeah. the arguments, but I, I, was, I, I actually do think if they say, well, what about this? And, what about, and they give you some ridiculous examples. Say, okay, maybe more oh, interesting. And then I just kind of leave, leave the scene because... <laughs> <laughs> Because we've, 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 we've had um, atheists on here saying they they don't use a regular doctor if they've not checked out that he's a doctor or just just to <laughs> challenge a narrative or they won't use a particular gadget unless they know how it works because the idea because like, so, I always say to them look you believe many things in your day to day life that you don't verify exactly. Exactly. They, they, that they do verify these things, and that's why it goes absurd. Yeah, just, I mean, it's embarrassing when they say that because you know the whole of science now. Like when we study science in school and beyond, we study it through textbooks. Now, no one's going to go and recreate, you know, a thousand experiments. If we know a thousand scientific facts, which I'm sure a lot of us, especially the doctor, Doctor Imran, maybe he knows ten thousand or hundred thousand. For us laymen, we have maybe. Did something like this, but for all scientific facts that I've learned, and uh, I'm sure the doctor as well, right? He hasn't gone into the laboratory, putting on the lab coat, and getting the same numbers of participants, and so on, and and, and kind of say, oh, you, you prescribe, um, you know, whatever it is you prescribe to your patients, but you haven't actually seen its effect in the laboratory. You you actually depend upon the testimony of those people that peer reviewed whatever it is uh, drug, 100%, yeah, 100%. Uh, right? It has to be like that, otherwise it's. Mm -hmm. It's absurd, and and so if they if they're trying to eliminate this testimony, 
then it's ridiculous. Then then we can start denying the Holocaust and stuff like that. We can start denying everything, really. We can start denying historical facts. We can start denying World War One actually ex- happened. But they don't live their lives like that. And if they, if they have any kind of discussion, they're not they're not going to do so on the pretense that, or you know uh, these things didn't happen. Or, so at the end of the day, I feel a lot of these atheists are just deceived. Uh, Self delusion. Uh, and uh, is it to, to really know the sincere one from the um, insincere one is when you start to probe their expectations on this point. Mm-hmm. I think that's where the starting point should be. If you have a friend who's, I had, a, you know, to be honest, I had, I was working maybe about nine, eight years ago. Now I was about nineteen years old. What man? Yeah, ten years ago. Yeah. So about nine, ten years ago, I was working in a in the city. And I had a and I had a manager. I'm not going to mention his name. He's, he, he's a he's a manager. And uh, you know, I was selling land at a time. I was a land broker. I was selling land. And and the guy, he was a, a vehement atheist. And I would try and give him dawah, you know, and so on. And this was before, obviously, YouTube generation and all that. I was giving him dawah, and giving the rest of the team uh, in the in, in in the office. I was giving them all dawah. And then one day. Something happened to him, and he started like calling for God and stuff. And I said to him, "Well, I thought you were, I thought you were an atheist." And he, he, he genuinely, he said, "Look, when I, I said to him, when you're in need, do you, do you do this regularly? Like when you're in need, you call for God?" He said, "Yeah." And I just thought so, but you were just debating me on the, you know, lunchtime, saying how ridiculous it is, or how ridiculous it was for God to exist. But it's like your dis, your psychological disposition changes. When when, it, when your life changes, and that's what the Quran says. A lot of these individuals, when they go and they have like a life altering situation, they're on the sea or something like that, mm. and something bad happens to them. They they cry to God. When they come back to the shore, you know, they go back to you know uh, polytheism or in this case atheism. Uh, and so the problem, I think, this is the, actually I would call this the fundamental problem with discussions of atheists that they have different standards. For different discourses, this is this is what, like, honestly, my experience has told me. Speaking to dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of atheists throughout the years, they have different standards for different discourses. But all discourses are actually the same kind of um, thing. And I'm not saying, by the way, the evidentiary bar should be the same in all discourses. Mm. But what I'm saying is, why do you raise the evidentiary bar to an impossible standard when you talk about God? Like you know, in this in this country, we have like courts, right? So we have civil courts, and then you have criminal courts. And for the civil courts, they say they say on the basis of probability. They, they actually use that language. They say on the basis of probability, this is what happened, and it's, that's enough to get. Because that's why in, in this in this kind, it's quite clever, right? But criminal convictions, they say beyond reasonable doubt. Hmm. They say beyond reasonable doubt. Obviously, there's a large degree of subjectivity there. But all they're saying is that we just need more evidence. We need the, the cumulative case to be to be more. But what the atheists are effectively saying is that we are not accepting, or not, not all of them, but in these cases, we're not accepting on base of probability, and we're not even accepted um, beyond reasonable doubt. We're not accepting any of this. We're going to continue you know, being skeptical at every stage. And I feel like that is the fundamental point. If that is the case, then we'll have to, we'll have to wait and see you know, when we die, what's going to happen? That's all I can. If I were literally not being filmed or something, and I, I, I feel like <clears throat> because when I'm being filmed, like I'm sure you do as well, we, we, we see people. We talk through them because after a while, you think this guy's antagonistic. He's hostile. We're just we're not we don't care about like sorry to say we do care about you, but we care more about the people that are watching now because at this uh, mm-hmm. stage we just want to see the absurdity. We want them to see the absurdity of what you're saying. We want to really demolish your arguments, but. If I was on day to day and I'm at work and, I, and there's a colleague who just keeps being, it's a waste of time to engage with them. Really, I would say, yeah. if they if they say if they keep being ultra skeptical and whatever, just say okay, well, to you, your religion, to me, whatever religion that may be, or to you, your way, and me, my way, and let's find out until uh, you know when we, when we die. Yeah. And let the let best time. One to thing to that. Can I just add yeah. one thing to that, and then um, yeah, let him run, Steve. Um, yeah. You see, when, when I'm speaking to atheists, to be honest with you, I'm not really trying to convince them to believe in a creator. 
Yeah. All I'm trying to demonstrate to them is that my belief in a creator is rational, reasonable, and logic, logical. I don't yeah. care whether they accept it or not, to be honest with you. It's just that I want to make sure my position that I'm holding is yeah. a solid, reasonable position. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they're going to be skeptical and they're going to don't, don't even acknowledge they exist and all this kind of stuff. That's got nothing to do with yeah. what, I, what I believe. You get me? So um, yeah. and I think this is what will lead us on to why. So the idea of God, when we see God, we're, you know, I don't like using the word God. I'll be honest with you. You know, when yeah. I speak to an atheist, they use the word more than I do. I, I try not yeah. to mention it at all. Yeah. yeah I put God in the title yeah. of this, though, to yeah. uh, bait the atheists into the room. Yeah. yeah. Because they, they need to because they're always asking for this evidence. So, like I say, uh, this will lead us on to what do we when we say God or Creator or Allah? What are we what are we re referring to? Because they have this kind of Christology style, old man in the clouds. That's why they call about sky yeah. wizard and all this kind of business. I think it's interesting to to demonstrate what we actually believe when we say a Creator or God. What we're referring so to. As Muslims, what we believe is obviously how our idea of Allah, the Creator. The ultimate creator um, uh, basically describes himself. But I like to differentiate between and when we're talking about, to atheists, I don't I don't introduce them to the mercy of God. I don't introduce them to the love of God. I don't introduce them to a lot of the attributes, the forgiveness or the forgiving nature of God. Because these things, for the most part, I agree that if you are going to make an argument from first principles, it's going to be very um, tenuous. It's going to be a difficult uh, to 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 prove those particular attributes, or it's going to be more way more difficult than proving, for example, oneness and omnipotence and uh, will and um, necessity and so on. And so, for the purposes of discussing it with an atheist, what we're talking about is the ultimate course. That's mm. what we're talking. About. We're talking about basically the thing, which and it's okay to call God a thing because He calls Himself. That in the Quran, قل أي شيء إن أكبر الشهادة قل لا. What thing is the best in testimony? Say Allah. This is uh, so. So the entity, okay, the entity that uh, basically breaks the infinite regress of dependent things and breaks the infinite regress of causes. We're talking about something which, if it didn't exist, an absurdity would exist. Mm -hmm. Either or, uh, either an absurdity of causes. Or infinite regress of course that is an absurdity by the standards of almost all philosophers throughout the ages or and or um uh, an absurdity of uh, an infinite regress of dependent things so we're talking about an entity which allows us which allows us to make sense of uh, the world without contradiction without the contradiction of an infinite regress of causes or an infinite regress of dependent things we're talking about the eternal thing which everything depends upon and it depends upon nothing and how we come to that conclusion requires argumentation uh, I, I would make that postulation just abstractly i'd, I'd require um space to, to, to obviously articulate why it is the case that you can't have an infinite regress of causes or infinite regress of dependent things but basically when we're talking about um god on a basic level we're basically talking about from the islamic perspective what sort of ikhlas uh, refers to which is uh Allahu Ahad say he's God one and only. So it's one God without a second, right? Or a third or a fourth. Um Allahu Samad, the th the entity which everything depends upon and it depends upon everything. They they translate as the sovereign, but this Samadiyya is basically this idea that everything depends upon it, where it depends upon nothing. This that is what's for me. Yasmudu ilayhi al ashya that everything depends upon it and it depends upon nothing. That's what that's what some others. Lam yalid wa yulid is he begets not nor is he begotten. But as a lot of the commentators say, that indicates uh pre-eternality and post-eternality as well. So we're talking about the one eternal thing which everything depends upon and uh, it depends upon nothing. That's what we're talking about on the base level. Um, and I think that the moment all I'm trying to do with an atheist is get them to believe in that. Uh, if they believe in that, then they've left their atheism. And then stage two would be, would be Quranic arguments, mm -hmm. would be prophetic arguments. And with that comes all the rest of the attributes and so on. Because yeah. 
I don't think so many of the attributes can be proven from first principles. It is actually textual. So I think I think um like that's really really good uh, uh, laying out. So in in the in going right back to the epistemology, of people and the, talking to atheists mm -hmm. and establishing with them sort of roots to knowledge. Um, one of the things that you find is that even though they may accept argumentation as a valid mechanism of, of, of attaining knowledge, they seem to give it less weight than other types of evidence. So they almost don't think it's as valuable as a method of of attaining knowledge. And in t when it comes to this, the, the skepticism that we see uh, when it comes to discussing God, they, they often you get this catchphrase, which is sort of well known, that you know um, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the the thing that comes to mind is in with, for those people who would say that or who would feel that uh, maybe logical argumentation or philosophical argumentation isn't a valid way or, or as valid a way as other ways, and usually they're referring to in materialistic ways or instrumentalism or something like this. Those those are not as not uh, the, the argumentation isn't as valid as other ways of uh, attaining knowledge. How would you approach to sort of trying to show that yes they are, and how then this question of is the claim for the existence of this necessary being an extraordinary claim? And I've often argued that it isn't, but I was wondering what your perspective might be. Well, I think that this point of extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence is itself a claim which requires evidence, right? So. Because there's, they've done two things here, which are bypasses. I would call them bypasses. Is that they have um, they've made a claim without evidence, which contradicts their first point, which extraordinary. Because I'll say, what's your what's your evidence that extraordinary claims require yeah. extraordinary evidence? Yeah. And for the most part, they can't produce empirical evidence for that claim. Uh, in fact, it's impossible for them to produce. Going back to empiricism, empirical evidence for the claim that. And this, I think, was, was from Christopher Hitchens. I, um, remarkable yeah. claims come from. Yeah, I mean, that's the first issue. The second issue is labeling it as an extraordinary claim. Because what's the evidence that this, because in the in the in the world of epistemology, right, all claims are equal. I mean, mm -hmm. if we're not talking about um, the arguments of probability, because I understand that obviously in that in that world things are different. But I'm talking about because when you use the word extraordinary, what do you actually mean? Why is it extraordinary? Like, on what basis is something extraordinary uh, to something not being extraordinary? There's no scientific method, if you like, or mathematical method, or even logical method of distinguishing extraordinary claims from non-extraordinary. Therefore, the language that's being used is not scientific language. It's not logical language. And I don't even think it's neutral language. It's basically, um, it's, 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 it's a type of language, a hyperbolized, exaggerated type of language, intended mm -hmm. only to um, depict the far-fetchedness of particular religious discourses, which doesn't have it, it was really a weightless kind of uh, claim. So when we talk about types of claim, so if we're talking about mathematical claims or logical claims, I know what you're talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But the moment you start saying extraordinary claims, you're employing a great level of subjectivity into that discourse. Because for me, what's, a sub what's an extraordinary claim is different to what's an uh, extraordinary claim for you. So I would start by saying this type of language gets us nowhere because you're, yeah. us you're using subjective value judgment to label something as extraordinary when in fact there's nothing to, there's nothing scientific about making one set of claims extraordinary versus uh, another set of claims which you might find. Like for, for some, like Nietzsche, for example, go back to Nietzsche. He wrote a book called Beyond Good and Evil. Okay, And for him, he was a high critic of science and the scientific method. But when it came, when he, he had sort of like a mental breakdown. And this is why I say that a lot of these guys are just, when it comes to standards, they have um, double standards. They, they don't live their life based on their principles. When it came to his mental breakdown and before he died, he went to a doctor. But what happened to his philosophizing of the point that you know, science is is, is so corrigible uh, to the point of being almost extraordinary to believe in. That high level skepticism really didn't didn't materialize in his uh, day to day. Therefore, I would I would start by saying this language, this this is how easily to talk in cross purposes when you use subjective value judgments rather than uh, measurable uh, or specific uh, type of language. So if I say, for example. Mathematical claims 
require mathematical evidence. I think that's a very clear what I'm saying. If I want to prove how 2 plus 2 equals 4, or if I want to prove um, quadratic expressions, I'm going to do so using mathematics. I'm not going to do so using, um, uh, you know, physics, although physics depends on this. Uh, I'm not going to do so using, I don't know, um, biology or something. It, it's, not, this, it's, it's not the same category. It wouldn't be, it would be a category mistake, a fallacy. Yeah. But where you can't, where you can't, um, basically, this is how we summarize this kind of, uh, this objection. Where you can't determine a category mistake fallacy, okay, if I don't speak in the same category terms, then what you're saying is basically uh, subjective and is something which, so in other words, if I say mathematical claims require mathematical evidence, if you use something else to try and determine mathematical evidences, I'll say you're doing a category mistake fallacy. If you if you're saying extraordinary, but extraordinary is this is a this is not a category of extraordinary things. And if it were to be a universal transcendental category, it would have to be subjectively um, assessed. It, it, in logical terms, it's not a set that underneath it has constituent parts because mm. a set is defined as something with zero or more than one member, right? So it's not a set or a category universal that underneath it there's so many things. It doesn't fall within that purview for that reason this language has to be identified as totally subjective and basically allows us to speak cross purposes and gets us nowhere in discussion that's why i would basically start by saying and yeah i'll agree with you in saying that it's for us it wouldn't be like if we want to talk subjectively for me it's not an extraordinary claim but yeah. you say yes it is an extraordinary claim and then we can both speak subjectively but there's there's no measurable way of coming to a conclusion here yeah. It's um, funny that when the actual when an atheist actually says those words, he thinks it's a mic drop moment. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> he, he watched it on a YouTube clip somewhere. Um, yeah. I think I think one guy just said it, didn't he, in some kind of conversation, I think, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Maybe was Christopher, Hitchens, yeah. uh, Christopher Hitchens was like a sophist, a proper sophist. But he beat most people in his debates because of his ability to outwit them and outcharm them. Um, but really, yeah. Yeah, but really, if you if you transcribe what he said and what his opponent said, I think that you'll realize he, his opponents probably won him and beat him in most debates. But mm -hmm. if you watch it, you'll think he's beating everyone. Okay, well, yeah, that's the yeah, that's the strongest way, isn't it? Um, okay, so we've we've touched on the argument for contingency. So. Um, how would we demonstrate to atheists that our belief in an uncaused cause of all that exists is a rational uh, belief to hold? Yeah, so this is what I would I say. I usually use the Kalam. Kalam you, I'll be honest with you. You know everything begins to exist requires a cause. Yeah, I I use that. That's good. That, that, I think that works. The only thing is that a lot of people like nowadays have started to question premise two and it becomes a long discussion. If they don't question premise two, then no problem, which is everything begins to exist as a cause. The universe began to exist. If they don't say the universe is eternal or this and that, which, I mean, for all intents and purposes, they can say that. It won't stunt the dis discussion and you can just say, well, the universe, uh, th therefore the universe has a cause and then you can proceed to what infinite regresses and so on. But the reason why I use contingency, personally, I, I prefer it, is it, it, it's, it's a bit um, longer to make the argument in the first instance, but the counters to it are much less. Whereas the, with the Kalam cosmological argument can be made in three minutes, but the counters to it are much more. And yeah. I prefer, I mean, you can do, you can decide to have a long um, introductory stage and then, you know, a, a shorter subsequent stage or, the, or vice versa. For me, I just prefer putting everything out there so that when they come to try and refute it, there's literally almost nothing that they can say. Because yeah. what they usually do with the Kalam is that they'll they'll question causation. Okay. They'll they'll yeah. question or they'll question that the universe began to because these are the two major things that they'll do with it. Whereas with the contingency argument, I don't need causation for the contingency argument to be made. So when I make the contingency argument, I'm just saying that that um so all I'm saying is that you know they cannot be I'm going to try and summarize this in the shortest possible time. There cannot be an infinite regress of dependent things. That's that is a logical impossibility. So, for example, the phone that I'm using now to for, you know to film this, it depends upon something else, and that the, the charge depends upon something else, and that depends upon something else. And when we talk about dependence, we'll talk about relies upon something else in order for it to exist. So the category here is existence. Mm. So if we're talking about category, the category is existence, and we're saying that okay, my phone 
exists. Everyone agrees. If you're an empiricist, you'd agree. If you're not an empiricist, you'd still agree. If you're a dualist or an idealist, whatever it is you are, unless you want to be an, an extreme skeptic and say, I don't exist, the phone doesn't exist, in which case, is, I mean, I would, if you're such an extreme skeptic, would say then, is that claim that you're making, is that a true claim? And then it'll be a problem for, for that individual. But that's a different discussion. The point is, is there cannot be an infinite regress of things depending upon other things ad infinitum. Because then the question is, what does it all depend upon to exist? If this phone depends upon something else and this something else depends upon something else and that something else depends upon something else, in order to exist, and in order to exist should be highlighted here, then it has to um, ultimately have something which everything depends upon and it depends upon nothing. Otherwise, you would have an infinite regress of dependent things. So think of it like dominoes falling upon each other. If you have dominoes knocking upon each other, then that image there should show you that, okay, one dependent domino knocks another dependent domino, knocks another dependent domino, knocks another... And if they're all falling, that shows you that they're all dependent. And therefore, they cannot all stand still, uh, stand high, without there being some kind of foundation that they will lean upon. Likewise, if you go to the bit of the sea, right? You don't have to see that the sea floor you don't have to see the sea floor to realize that the sea is, is basically being lifted by it, something. Because you know the nature of water, that it falls, right? So we know that water is, especially in the gravitational world that we live in, if water falls and you go to the sea and the sea doesn't have a sea floor, then what is it basically being balanced upon? So you, you'd conclude there's a sea floor, even though you haven't seen it. So we're saying that the, the world and existence works in analogous way. And that's why Allah's Actually, from an Islamic perspective, it's called the Qayyum. And the Qayyum comes from Qama Yaqum, that's where Qadqam to Salah, which literally means stand for prayer because he's making everything stand. Literally, that's because he everything depends on him in order to exist and he depends upon nothing. That That is one of the words. And Samad is very similar to the word Qayyum in that sense. So from those angles, we're saying logically, how do you explain? This would be the question I always ask them. How can you explain a world with only things that depend upon other things that depend upon other things ad infinitum? You, in order to maintain a position that that is the case, you'd have to explain how that is the case. How could it be that things depend upon, in order to exist, other things that depend upon other things ad infinitum? If they say, no, we don't believe that, we do believe that there is something that everything depends upon and it depends upon nothing, then we've reached the point of Surat al-Ikhlas. Which is basically that's what we, uh, the halas. Uh, I believe now atheism is impossible to believe in atheism and believe in that at the same time. Uh -huh. You've at least reached a point of deism. Now that's yeah. now atheism has gone out the, the, the window. You, you're at least a deist at this point. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. So I think to, that's a, the, it's a very powerful um, argument. So one of the things that helps people to maybe understand a little bit more is this 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 thing we're using the term contingent and contingent so how how would an individual if they're trying to assess this for themselves know the difference between something that is contingent and something yes. that is not contingent how would they be able to That's differentiate the two things because in our experience we don't know of a incontingent thing in our experience apart from the creator because this is the, the argument that's being made so yeah, yeah, how, yeah. Does a, how does a person differentiate between something that's incontingent and something that isn't what are the the, the ways of doing that all right philosophically I've, you know avicenna who's even seen it right he 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 says this he says and obviously we don't agree with all of his views and you know i don't want to go into this but i just look at philosophical arguments we try and filter those things which are theologically uh, fine and does which are not but he 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 says basically something which is um contingent is uh something which can be taken out of creation and no absurdity would occur mm -hmm. something which can be taken out of the world and no absurdity would occur uh, that's the definition but also something which depends upon something else in order to exist those two things so Something which depends upon something else. So, for example, the human being. I mean, the human being. And by the way, Allah says that in the Quran. Were they created from nothing? Or are they themselves the created themselves? In other words, without my parents, I couldn't be here. They were an effective cause for me. So, I was contingent upon my parents. And they're contingent upon their parents. That's something which is observable, right? So, observably, we can see that, okay, there's contingency there. 
But also, if I were to be taken out of this world, just as there was a time that I wasn't in this world, no absurdity would occur. Yeah. When we're talking about absurdities, this is to be um, in contradistinction to, um, sorry, in contradistinction to uh, impossibilities. So a contingent, a contingent thing is uh, demarcated from a impossible thing because an impossible thing cannot be in the world. A squared circle cannot actually be in the world. So uh, the category of impossible things has no members. If that makes sense. If, if you want to describe it in set terms, it has no members. Whereas the category of contingent things has a finite am um, uh, amount of members. And that and that set or that category um, encompasses everything which, in order for it to exist, requires something else, either preceding it, in it doesn't have to be time, or it, for it to be required for it. So it doesn't have to be a, a, a preceding in time format, but it, it, it just has to... Um, Without it, it wouldn't be basically. Without X, Y wouldn't be. Right. And that basically that 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 formula can be expressed for almost everything observable. Basically, everything observable, everything tangible, everything within the world is fits the formula. Without X, Y wouldn't be. Okay. And so, just to sum just to summarize, so basically, if something could not have existed without yeah. affecting anything that thing is in, in is is contingent um and the other thing that you mentioned is that if it if it's clearly requiring something else for it to be as it is um yeah, the first so thing was so for, for to be taken out of creation no absurdity would exist yeah no no so creation would not collapse upon itself there would be no impossibilities that would exist contra contradictions or logical uh, impossibilities basically that so for example let me give you um a trivial maybe not not trivial but maybe an example that will help understand uh, the law of non-contradiction whether you want to believe it empirically or in a platonic yeah. way or whatever if that law itself didn't exist then contradictions would exist so the law has to exist so if you remove it then there'll be contradictions and that's why in in the in the category of facts okay the law of non-contradiction is axiomatic and it's also necessary. Yeah. Just like 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a necessary fact. But that's the category here is facts. Yeah. And what we're talking about with the creator is the category of existence. Mm. So in the category of existence, uh, if you take the necessary existence out, then everything else doesn't make sense. Everything else would collapse, basically. Whereas in the category of facts, there's so many examples of facts that if you take them out, contradictions would occur. But what's more foundational, facts or existence? We would say existence is more foundational yeah. because without existence, there could be no facts because facts have to exist. So yeah. in other words, uh, 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 existence is presupposed in facts and facts not presupposed in existence. And yeah. therefore, the, the, the master key category is existence. And we say, therefore, the um, necessary existence is uh, required. Otherwise, nothing would make sense. There would be... A contrary, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to explain uh, anything. You wouldn't be able to explain the existence of any contingent thing without there ultimately being a necessary existence. Excellent. So one of the co common questions associated with Hamza is what, just uh, there's one of the common questions that's often asked, and I've seen it a few times in the in the chat actually scrolling up, is that okay? The, the, we can see that everything observable is contingent within the universe, but yeah. it. Is that is does that automatically, or is there a way of justifying the claim that therefore the universe itself is contingent? Can you have a set of contingent things where the set itself isn't contingent? That you can kind of have. Yeah, that's why the, this is the the fallacy of composition. Okay. So so the, this um so there's two fallacies. Uh, they're informal fallacies. One of them is called the fallacy of composition. The other one's called the fallacy of division, and they're both the opposite of each other. So the fallacy of composition is if one says, well, hold on. If you say um, parts of the elephant are small, therefore the elephant is small. Yeah, this is a fallacy, right? Because you're saying this the part, um, the the part can be generalized to the whole. It goes actually back to induction in a sense, right? Yeah. That there is a close connection uh, between the two. But we're not saying that because the part. This is not the argument. The the argument that that's something which usually people say is a counter to the Kalam cosmological argument. Because hmm. 
We say everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe had a cause. They'll ask you, well, with the first premise, and this is one of the counters, actually the counters of Bertrand Russell, he he was who popularized the, uh, the composition fallacy. He said, well, the first thing, everything that begins to exist has a cause. How do you determine that? They'll say, well, you determine that because everything that we can see around us, yeah, began to exist. The tree began to exist. I began to exist, right? And so inductively, we say that therefore the universe, so uh, the universe began to exist because it, because it's under this category of things we call thing, and there, therefore the universe has a cause. So the problem here is then someone will come back, and this is the most famous and probably the most powerful to be uh, open about this argument against. They'll say, well, uh, you're saying just because the parts of a thing possess property A, that the thing itself possesses property A. In the famous discussion between Copleston and um, uh, and uh, Bertrand Russell, which actually you can find online, he said that's saying it's like saying that just because the individual members of human race have a mother, that must mean that the human race has a mother. He's, he was saying that that's a composition fallacy. But once again, it's like saying that just because the elephant is made up of small parts, therefore the elephant is small, this is a composition fallacy. Two responses. Number one, not everything fits the fallacious form in other words you can conceive of situations where the part of the thing is in line with the totality of it so that's the first thing so for example we said that the example of the the, the elephant having small parts but being big is fallacious reasoning but you can have a wall that's made up of red bricks for example or blue bricks yeah and it's blue in its entirety so it's not necessarily fallacious always it's, it is um, a leap you have to make when you're saying everything that begins with has a cause because we're seeing everything uh, has um, um, everything within the thing has a cause. And for that, what I would say is this, a syllogism that's prepared nicely for the universe objection, okay? Which is actually, I, I can't attribute it to myself. This uh, is attributed to, and once again, when I quote these guys, I'm not endorsing their theologies, all right? Uh, they're all class as heretics Islamically, but um, you know, but they have gems, and, and I, I just try to extrapolate those. Gems. I, I think this was by Al Farabi, right? Which is one of the um, philosophers before Abis uh, Avicen, uh, Ibn Sina. So he says this. He says anything that is made up. And this is called um, basically it's, it's an argument from parts, right? Anything that is made out of parts is generated. Okay, so that's premise A. Anything that is made out of parts. Is generated. The universe is made out of parts. Therefore, the universe is generated. Okay. Yeah. So, if everything is made out of parts, this is how I would combat this composition first. Anything that is made out of parts is generated. The universe is made out of parts. Therefore, the universe. How do we know that everything that is made out of parts is generated? Because, in order for something to exist, if it has parts, it depends upon those parts to be. In other words, if you reassemble them or disassemble them, it will be something else in its entirety. In other words, in order for it to be as it is, it has to have all those parts arranged the way it's arranged in whatever yeah. form formulation it is. But it's it's possible to conceive of a universe that would still be a universe if it didn't have certain members within it. And if you believe in the expanding universe model, which is let's say for the sake of argument, still the dominant, uh, in my understanding, and I'm not a cosmologist, still the dominant um, cosmology around, though Penrose and, and Co are kind of moving away from that and going to like other models. But even if you, uh, that's, that's another objection, by the way, but uh, then the expanding model is more evidence towards that because you'll say, well, it's expanding, meaning it's uh, getting bigger. And if it's getting bigger, then uh, once again, what it was yesterday is different to what it is today. And if that is the case, then uh, once again, that shows you that uh, the, the thing is changing. And for yeah. it to change, it contradicts its necessity, it contradicts its, its eternality, it contradicts so many things, and it's, uh, and so on. But the, the three-stage argument for why the universe can't be the necessary existence is, A, anything that is made out of parts is contingent, it's, sorry, it's generated. Yeah. The universe is made out of parts, therefore the universe is generated. Alhamdulillah. I have one, one other objection to the Kalam argument, uh, talking about yeah. time. 
saying that time only began when the universe came into existence. So how can you have cause and when there's no time? This this is one argument I've heard. Um, how how was the easiest response to that? Now, Hamza Horses usually um, gives a thought of experiment where he found from David Hume, where he talks about like conceptually uh, this pillow, uh, and then it's kind of like got an indented. Uh, yeah, I've heard that one. Have you heard that one? Yeah. Where, where, where someone like sits down on a on a sofa or something, they create these dents. Yeah, yeah, press the end, uh, the, the okay, dent like, in there. You can imagine that. But for for me, I mean, once again, my my uh, my contingent or the contingency argument I like to uh, advocate yeah. is not something which depends on time at all. No, I know, but I'm talking about the cause or the, the calam because um, when you say cause, you're implying there must be some time to do that. For me, it's just there must yeah. be some time we're not aware of. I mean, time as we know it may be coming okay, to existence. So in, in philosophy, there's two there's two series. It's a, B, um, a and B theory of time, right? If someone was a proponent, if someone is making the claim that there was no time before, if they say t equals zero, okay? And this is the example that they'll give. They'll say there was no time within the universe that existed and so on. And therefore, what, co what the cause happened had to happen outside of time or how could it happen outside of time? These kinds of objections. The objection that, or the, the, the claim that they're making requires evidence that there was no time, time equals zero. Because first of all, what we have to understand is what, and this might get a bit complicated now, what is time? Because first of all, in philosophy, and especially in Islamic theology as well, interestingly, there's different conceptions of it. So a nominalist would say, like Ibn Taymiyyah, quite interestingly, he, he, didn't, even, he didn't even believe time existed um, as a category. He said time is just... Um, you know, uh, speed. He didn't mention speed over distance, or, or he didn't mention the phys physics term. But he just says is is events happening, event A and event B, and that which is between the two events. So a nominalist, I could I could be even more skeptical than the person who's saying uh, that time didn't exist um, before the universe created, and say that time still doesn't exist because universals categories like time and um, genuses basically like okay, sorry to. Go back. A genus is basically like a master category. So, for example, if I say fatherhood, right, or f um, motherhood, motherhood doesn't exist. You could argue, right? Are you, uh, as a category, a category is only uh, identified by its members. So, if I say the idea of um, hoarseness, how do we identify what hoarseness is? We do so through its individual members. So, you have horses, like horse one, horse two, horse three. We have horses, right, in the world, right? The quality of hoarseness is determined by the members of a category. If we got rid of all the horses, would hoarseness still be there? So the, the question of uni do universals exist in the first place is a question that philosophers have been grappling with. For us, we don't necessarily care, to be honest about it, because what is time in its, in es it's in, uh, sorry, in its essence? In a physics format, they say speed over distance. Is that correct? Yeah. Speed over distance equals time. T equals what? T, S over D, right? If From what I remember, I, I might be uh, incorrect here. But so long as you... And this is the argument from... Um, Al-Ghazali actually uses this argument. He says that so long as you believe in time, you have to believe in someone who's moving. Because If you believe in time, you have to believe in someone who's moving because time indicates movement. Without movement, basically, there is no time. Mm. And even physics, it's like that in physics. Because if, if time equals speed over distance... There has to be some kind of uh, movement going on, right? Otherwise, how can you have speed? Of, like, well, think of it this, right? If I have a car and I'm not covering distance with speed, then I'm not moving. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if there's, no, if there's no events that are happening, there's no time, okay? So it's begging the question to say, well, time equals zero when the universe, before the universe began, because you're trying to say that there was no event that took place before the universe before, yeah, did you get what exactly, I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah, so you're, you're trying to say that before the universe, there was no, you're, basically you're making the. If you say there was no time before the universe, what you're saying was that there were no events before the uh, before the Big Bang. That's what you're saying. And for me, that's begging the question because remember, we say that what is time? Time is speed over distance, or well, you can even just say for the sake of argument, movement. Time equals movement, right? For the sake of argument. And for movement to happen, there needs to be events that take place event A and event B. And if you say before the universe there was time equals zero, then effectively you're making the claim that there were no events before the universe. Mm. And that claim itself requires evidence. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that actually de demolishes multiverse. I mean, 
it de demolishes so many things that these uh, these um, the, uh, physicists are talking about. If you say that there was no such events that took place before the universe. So when they say it equals zero at the uh, universe, what you're effectively making the claim about is that there were no events that took place pre-Big Bang. And for them to make that claim, they would have to provide the evidence. But they, if you reformulate it for them, because remember, time, what is time? Time is just movement. That's all it is. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is that yeah. 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 Does that, yeah. Make, does that make sense? Yeah. I'm it's kind of what I say, to be honest with you. I just basically say, well, look, well, something happened, so there must have been some kind of time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it, it, Whether you understand it or not, it's not good. It's not good. <laughs> this was a problem, man. When I'm jibber jabber waffling, and you just say it like in one sentence. Like that. <laughs> it's so close, it's so. <laughs> so All right. So I would basically say that everything we've said so far is just basically demonstrating that we believe from the argument con from contingency that there must be a necessary being, and that for us is evidence of a creator. Would you not? That's basically what we're saying, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. That, that. Okay. So what, it depends on what you're talking like Now at this point of creator, now they're going to ask, what do you mean by creator? When I say creator, what? I just say necessary being. I don't mind. Yeah, okay. I mean, something, uh, once again, cause, I think cause is more neutral than creation. But once again, the moment you yeah. start saying there's an ultimate cause, then really and truly, it becomes a, almost a synonym with the word creation. Because whatever caused the thing is, is now, if, if it's Obviously. the first thing... Or, Yes, yeah, it's, it's created it, right? It's, it's brought into yeah. existence. It wasn't there before, especially if you believe in ex nihilo, that it yeah, happened from nothing. Yeah, because what I was when I use a Kalam argument, me personally, and I get, I just get to an uncaused cause, then I believe yeah. the qualities of this uncaused cause, it must be powerful because it's create, it's caused something more powerful than, than anything yes. we know. It must yeah. be intelligent through what it's caused. It must be conscious for the it chose, choosing to cause. Yeah. Um, I don't believe all knowing and at that stage, but then anything else we learn about if you want to go into the you know the attributes of Allah, then that will come through whatever that cause reveals about itself, and that's when we come to religion. But um we, we want to just uh, what I'm happy with for this stream to do today is just to establish that um belief that uh, necessary necessary being um is a reasonable to believe exists, and this is evidence enough to accept that uh, belief. I think the atheists yeah. are in the chat ready to go. Um, there is one okay. atheist I'm not going to invite on, uh, T Jump. A few reasons. <laughs> oh, um, he falls into that category, um, what you said about the hyper skepticism, not knowing if you exist, are you a jar in a room or whatever. It's just too hyper skeptic for one. But two, I've read comments. He's basically, I've allowed him to take, uh, you know, he came on Sabor's stream, mashallah. And he, 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 I allowed him to take the video clips. And when I read the comments on his channel, he actually says these words. No, I don't really care what they say, just as long as I get the views. So for me, that person's got no integrity. It's so disingenuous. And I'm not going to allow that person to build a platform based on... <laughs> so what are you going to tell them to do? jump out of the chat? <laughs> 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 well, that's it. Because, is that know, actually he, is he, that, says that... Crazy stuff. he says a lot of crazy stuff, but it's so far out there that um, I don't think it's suitable for what we're doing anyway. And like I said, mm. I, if someone's not interested in truth, which is what we're doing here, then yeah. go, go 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 find someone who's like that, but whether you know, treat to Pavlov or something, but you know, so T jump and, 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 and that's the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is, Pavlov. <laughs> that's the bottom line. Right. So the thing is, you know, guests, uh, you want to jump on? Um, we what we'll do, we'll see how the atheists go. And then, inshallah, if you don't mind, uh, we'll invite Muslims to come and ask some, maybe some Dawah Dilemma questions, some things they've got stuck on when they're speaking to atheists. What do you think? Yeah, Absolutely, man. I'm, I'm happy. We're, we're happy, man. Okay, we've got, we've got Good. a couple yeah. lined up already. So I'm going to invite the first one on now. Welcome mm. to the den. Hi there. How are you doing? Welcome. Oh, let me just take... Let me just take uh, <laughs> My little banner off so we can see who you are. Is that T jump? No, yeah, that's digital gnosis. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, hi. So, um, I'm well, I, I, I'm actually under the power of Satan and I've been sent here to lead Muslims to hell. Um, just before we talk or anything, I want you guys to be aware of that. Um, just so you know, I don't want to be dis accused of being dishonest or anything. That's fine. Yeah, go on, carry on. Good point. <laughs> no, that's that's it. Oh, that's it. Okay. 
Yeah, I, ju I just didn't want you to think I was being dishonest or anything, but I'm I'm completely under the power of Satan. Um, All right, do you have a question? Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, for yeah. for example, I got like um, I can tell you why the the argument that was given was wrong because um, everything that happens happens according to Allah's will. There aren't any contingent things to be what, the first. What was the argument given? The argument given would be. Um, what, which of Aquinas' ways is it? Is it the third way of Aquinas or um it's third way, yeah. Yeah. So so there are there are possible uh, you know, like you've got to accept Aristotelianism in the first place, right? Um there are possible things because he's not using like uh he's not using the terms in like the modal sense that like a modern person would put them together. He's using like um something that's dependent on itself for its own existence or dependent on something else for its own existence. So that's uh you know that I, I'm guessing you're going with that one rather than like some kind of modal like um, there's things that exist in some possible worlds and all possible worlds and all possible worlds is a necessary thing, um, and then you're saying well something that um, depends on something else for its own existence you can't have an infinite regress of those things so there must be some necessary things, um, and then you can't have an infinite regress of necessary things so um, there must I, be um, some uh, did you sorry say, you yeah I think you you didn't articulate the the argument in the way that I did. Um, no, probably not. Yeah. Oh, okay. So long as you're aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm just kind of like paraphrasing. Um. But yeah, I don't think that's exactly what you said. To be honest, though, I kind of zoned out for a fair amount of it as well. Um. And I'm so also really stupid. Just so I understand, you paraphrase what you thought you said. Well, I'm also really stupid as well because um, five people in the chat have told me how stupid I am, and I just want to say I am really stupid. So that that's also why I can't recall what was just. All right, latest dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, seriously, come on, man! Come on, man! Come on, man. Uh, I, I, sorry, sorry, ask bad questions. You're a Muslim. Uh, agnostic theist, special label. Can I say something really quick? Can I ask you some questions? And obviously, I don't want to waste time. I, like, some of these, are, like in the chat, some of the atheists are embarrassing, to be honest. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so I wanted to make a comment and actually challenge one of the things you said. Okay. So um, right, so one of the comments that I wanted to make was that, you know, I was reading a book. It's called Britain, like Britain BC, so Britain before. And what they do is like they'll go around Stonehenge and they'll see circles arranged. Mm. Sorry, um, stones arranged in a circle, and they'll make. An assumption and they'll say someone put this this way when you look like a dna molecule which is infinitely more complex how can you say it's random it's so silly but that's just that's just one thing i want to say now the thing about the contingency argument is that have you heard of arthur penrose's ccc model where it's in like a cyclical kind of universe kind of thing so i kind of think that makes a little more sense because if you think about it mm -hmm. god is also contingent but on himself so why can't you have an eternal universe that is contingent on itself in a CCC type model going round? And this would make more sense, I think, um, because you God won't have to create X Nilo. No, sorry, this you sorry this uh, universe won't have to create X Nilo, whereas God does. And yeah. you can say it's an argument from ignorance, but isn't everything? Then you could just say that about everything, and they could uh, just say that all oh, contingent things can depend on, on each other. Okay, yeah, I, I, think, I think there's some interesting, interesting uh, interrogation, interrogation there. there. I'd like, I'd like to like just to kind of put your attention. Your attention. Uh, there's an echo in there. Can you mute? Sorry, yeah, I'll mute myself. I'll mute myself. Sorry. Yeah, so <clears throat> in terms of eternality of the universe, it should be noted that most people who made this argument in the medieval period and classically in the um, uh, it, it classically in the Greek period uh, actually believed in, they were eternalists. So, for example, Aristotle, he didn't make this argument he didn't flesh it out, but he was an eternalist and he did believe in um, the eternity of the universe. Nevertheless, he did believe in prime mover in his book, in Physics. Uh, he he uh, elaborates his argument. Avicenna, Al Farabi, Al Kindi, and those medieval Muslim scholars, um, obviously, the label that, uh, you know, they refer to as Muslim scholars, their theology is shaky from that angle. They were eternalists as well. Okay, so they were making the same argument. So eternality of the universe does not affect the argument. And I'll tell you why. Because you mentioned Roger Penrose's um, CCC model. I just kind of looked at the... I, I, I think I finished the paper. He, he recently published a paper talking about this. And he, he changed his opinion, uh, Penrose. Um, he didn't have this 
he was he from my remember he was a he believed in Big Bang cosmology and then he kind of changed his uh, view quite recently. I think in the last five or ten years, I can't remember when it was. But putting that to the side, whether he believes in eternal universe or not, the question is as follows: Is the universe dependent or independent? If the universe, so let me ask that question to you: Is the universe, in your understanding, is it dependent? Is it contingent or is it independent and necessary? Which one would you choose from the two? Can you hear me? Is there an echo? No, it's good. No, it's good. No. Okay, yeah. No, uh, definitely the universe is definitely uh, dependent. Like in every way in terms of like beginning, time, space, location, everything about it is dependent. And like you said, one of the fact that it's expanding and so it has to be dependent on something else. But my point is, what if there's a time outside? So what if it's cyclical although cyclical is still contingent like a lot of atheists will say oh well uh, i solved it by making it into a circle a circle is still infinity it's still contingent it's still all it's in like a circle but um my point is that what if it's